Hey, welcome. This lesson is going to be about how to handle ballistic pendulum problems in physics and AP physics classes. So first of all, I do want to address what a ballistic pendulum is. So a ballistic pendulum is a pendulum of a known mass that has an object that's shot into it. Let me show you an animation of what I'm talking about. So if you have, say, a bullet or something like that lodged into a wooden block, and the wooden block swings up, and you can determine the height in terms of how much that block swings up, and you know the two masses, then you can infer how fast the original object is going. And so when people do ballistics, so to speak, what they're doing is determining characteristics about specific guns, and one of the things that you can determine is how fast the bullets will go out of that gun. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a ballistic pendulum here. And I used a site called OPhysics, and I'll put a link to that site in the description of this video below. So you can take a look at that when you get a chance. It's a great simulation website that you can take a look at. So in the process of talking about ballistic pendulums, we need to review briefly what is conserved when we're talking about momentum and energy and how to work with conservation of momentum and energy in problems. So let's go ahead and get to it. First of all, just super quick, if we're going to review elastic and inelastic collisions, remember inelastic collisions are going to have two objects that combine together, that stick together, so to speak. Think about like a tackle in football or something like that. Momentum is conserved in these cases. It's also conserved for elastic collisions as well. The one exception to this is that momentum is not conserved when the entire system is accelerating. So if you imagine the inside of a truck and a child is bouncing a ball off of the inside of the truck, like like the back window of a truck or something, or a, a car, if that car is accelerating, then the ball will not be rebounding off of that window in a way that it seems like it's conserved if the system was just the inside of the vehicle. So in that case, you could say, well, it is true to say that momentum is conserved if we increase the size of the system to include the entire vehicle as well. But if we're just looking at the inside of the vehicle, and the vehicle is accelerating, let's say, then it's not true to say that momentum is conserved in that case. So if there's a net force on an entire system, then we say that momentum is not conserved in that case. And it's true to say that energy is conserved as well, but certain types of energy are not conserved. In other words, in an inelastic collision like you see in the upper left up here, the kinetic energy of the objects initially are not the same as the kinetic energy of the objects finally. So you could say, well, what happens to the kinetic energy? Well, in the event of an inelastic collision, some of that energy is lost as heat or friction or possibly deformation of the object if you're talking about like a car crash or something like that. When you're dealing with an elastic collision or a perfectly elastic collision, then kinetic energy is conserved. So all of the energy that was there before the event is equal to all of the energy you have after the event. All right, so having said that and having reviewed, let's go ahead and start thinking about what kind of a problem we could approach. So if we had a problem where there were essentially three parts to it. So the first part dealt with a spring with a ball bearing and it gets compressed and then it will be released. And then the ball bearing embeds itself into a ballistic pendulum. That would be essentially part two of this problem. And then part three of this problem would be is this ballistic pendulum swung up and we measured some of those things and we wanted to work backwards so to speak so that's what we're going to be approaching today is figuring out how to approach a problem like this because this is kind of in the vein of what you might see on the AP exam all right so here's some of the known values we have I'm just working with variables here instead of numbers and we're going to be asking for what the k value is. So that was all the way in part one. We have more information about part three. So it turns out that we're actually going to work backwards from part three back to part two and then part one. So let's take a look at part three. Part three is the swing. And during the swing, you have a conservation of energy problem. So that's kinetic swinging up into potential energy. What you can do is draw a diagram where you have the length of the rope or whatever it is that's supporting it is going to be the same as this length over here. They're the same lengths, they're just in different positions, right? And then we can continue with the problem and do mechanical energy initial is equal to mechanical energy final. There's no significant friction here. So we know that we can make the potential energy here zero. Essentially, this would be our zero height right here. And we know that at its highest maximum point, its kinetic energy is going to be zero. So we're going to simplify by knocking out those two terms, and we'll write in what we have. Be careful here that the two masses 
are added together, the mass of the ball bearing and the mass of the pendulum themselves. So at this point, what could we do to simplify the problem? Well, we could divide out the masses, right? So we're going to go ahead and do that and think to ourselves, what do we not know? Well, we don't know what the speed is. It actually turns out that we don't know what the height is either in terms of these other variables. We need to be careful when we're doing an AP problem to only use the variables that they give us. In other words, we can't get an answer that has H in it left over. We have to convert H into something else. So I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute. But first, we're going to say let's solve for V initial and we don't know our H as well. So how do we get our H? Well, we said that this could be zero at the zero point. We want H right here. Think to yourself for a moment, how could you solve for this H value? All right, well, you're gonna to need to know how to do this for conservation of energy problems for an AP class for sure. I'll put a link up to a lesson I did just on this topic, but what you can say is you know the total length here, you know the total length here, so that's like your hypotenuse, and you want this adjacent leg so this is an argument to be made for a strong diagram here to visualize what's going on. You have length is equal to the adjacent plus the height. So we can go ahead and write that. And then we can go ahead and solve for height. So I'm going to isolate for heights and continue with the problem. So check this out. This is working with cosine. We would get that value for our adjacent leg. And then isolating and plugging in this value for h, we would get this we could take this one step further in simplification and factor out an L and then in parentheses have one minus cosine theta. That could be done as well. But we do have our V initial now. We have our V initial for part three. Let's go ahead and think to ourselves, that's going to be our V final for part two. So let's go ahead and think about what's happening for part two here. So part two is just a conservation of momentum problem. So it's a two to one scenario. This is easy and hopefully is easy for you at this stage of the game. You're going to go ahead and remember to make this zero right here and to talk about the sum of the masses right here. And so we go ahead and at this point we're solving for our unknown isolating. We're ready to plug in what our value is for V from part three that we solve for because that V final for part two is the same as V initial for part three. So we can go ahead and sub that in. And this is where the algebra becomes a bit cumbersome. On the AP exam itself you would have like a just a number here would make this a little less busy in terms of the algebra. But that's what the initial velocity is going to be for the ball. And so that's the beginning of part two. That's also the end of part one. So let's go to part one really quickly and think about how to do this. This would be a conservation of energy problem where you're dealing with the elastic potential energy. And so we just do a conservation of energy, mechanical energy problem. So we're going to go ahead and start with that. We know that we do have potential energy here. It's just not gravitational to begin with. And we have no kinetic. This ball is not moving at the beginning. And there is certainly kinetic at the end here, and there's no potential at the end. So we're going to simplify this by getting rid of the things that we need to get rid of. We end up isolating for our unknown. At this point, be careful. This mass we're talking about is just the mass of the ball bearing, not the mass of both objects. So we continue, and I am running out of room. And what we're trying to get is this k value, so let's isolate for k. We continue to do that, and we are ready to sub in what that velocity was for the ball bearing. So that's going to go right here for the speed here, and you end up with this. Now that's a pretty busy answer, but again, on the test itself, if you had real numbers to work with, this would be a lot simpler and a lot cleaner. In any case, conceptually, that's how you would approach these types of ballistic pendulum problems. Hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.